Um, tonight we are doing a presentation on the Japanese film, uh, the Ghost Stories. Actually, Paul, all right. I will not be giving a presentation, presentation instead of our very own Clint Stroman show. Um, and that's really all I have to say. Clint? I just wanted Nick to introduce me because I know that most of you here don't know me. Um, I don't know most of you here. Um, and like Nick said, my name is Clint Stroman. Uh, I am not an expert on Japanese film. Uh, I, I'm a fan. I just want to get that out of the way. By no means am I an expert. Dude, you got the posters all over your house. I have like a poster. <laughs> so, um, a little bit about me. I do have a BFA in art and art history from U the University of Texas at Arlington. I went to UNO for a semester in the master's program at fi for film. So I do have that, whatever you know that piece of paper means. Um, but yeah, exactly. Not much. It does not mean much. Study. I studied. You paid Some a film. lot of money for that piece of paper. I paid a lot of money for a piece of paper It says I know a little bit about film. Um, let's see. Uh, and this this slide here is from one of my favorite films, Kuroniko, which we will get into later. I'm not sure if I am pronouncing any of these correctly. So if anyone can help me on the pronunciation, that would uh, be beneficial to me. But I think it's pronounced Kuroniko. So let's move on. And my little remote's not working on my iPhone, so I'm going to have to go up to the laptop every time. And a cheap plug for the Criterion Collection. If you're not familiar with Criterion, all the movies I'm discussing here today are available on the Criterion Collection. Um, they're on Hulu Plus. Uh, you can get that for like $7.99 a month. It's super cheap. Yeah. Okay. In the beginning, there were books. Well, actually, there were stories handed down the, uh, uh, verbally, and then they were written down. So, for a movie, um, you know, you have to have it based on some sort of written, thank you, something written. Uh, and, you know, by the time movies came along in the late 1800s, early 1900s, of course, the printing press was around. So, all of the stories that had been handed down throughout the ages had been pretty much written down. So, we had so movies had scripts already. And like a lot of modern Americans think that like basing movies on books like Harry Potter and stuff like that is kind of a new thing. And it's really not. Uh, movies have been based on previous material basically ever since they've been around. Uh, as far as Japanese culture goes, they've been based on kabuki theater and Buddhist tales, as we will see. Uh, Rashomon is one of the most famous examples of a movie that has been, let me start that over, Rashomon introduced Western culture to Japanese cinema, and it was based on In a Grove by that name that I can't pronounce, Akutagawa, um, that's my best guess. Um, and I bring up Rashomon, listen to Nick. <laughs> I bring up Rashomon because, let's see, what's, what's my next, okay, I kind of already went over that, that several of the films here uh, are going to be based on Buddhist tales, uh, and I kind of went crazy on the little, yes, sorry, you, just a oh, I'm sorry, no problem, <laughs> Thanks. I would also like to say that I haven't done public speaking in a while, so I'm pretty nervous. Um, okay, okay. Thank you. Um, it's okay. No. Dude, I assure you I've messed up so many times, but no one has any idea. Please, if you want to make comments, please interject. It would help me get a back and forth um, rather than just standing here and rambling on. Um, yeah, as I said, most of the films discussed here are based on Buddhist tales. And I brought up Rashomon because, um, that's the next slide, hold on. Um, Pre-war. Crazy stuff going on there. Okay. Before, before 1900, uh, there's really not much, before the war, there's not much that's left from Japanese cinema because of 
uh, several things, but um, I found a couple of shorts, Jizo the Spook and Resurrection of a Corpse, that didn't survive uh, film-wise, but people remembered them, so they wrote about them a little bit. Um, I didn't really find out too much about these two specifically, but people have written about them, so I assumed that they were actually filmed at some point. Let's see, what's next? Yes, these are the conditions that, because, uh, because of the bombing of Tokyo, the 1923 earthquake, the humidity, and nitrate film, less than 1% of the film that was shot in Japan actually survived. And what has survived is in really, really poor condition. I've, there's a couple of films by Ozu, and um, Kurosawa didn't really start making films until after the 40s. But Ozu and uh, somebody else, I'm blanking on the name right now, uh, they have survived, but they're really grainy, really scratchy. Uh, let's see, and nitrate film, I, if you're not familiar with nitrate film, uh, the process for film has changed over the decades, and it's based basically when nitrate film catches on fire, you can't put it out. Um, it has oxygen in it, so it combusts, and then it just keeps combusting upon itself. You can put it underwater, and it will still stay on fire underwater. So whenever all these films are stored, if one of them catches on fire, they all catch on fire. This has happened in America also at the Eastman uh, factory in the 50s. They lost a lot of their films that way too. Nitrate film was terrible. They stopped using it after about 1950s when they really stopped using it. Um, and then they went to acetate film and they use polyester film now. Well, they use digital now. But uh, let's see, I think there was another. Yes, and. During the war, uh, government mainly saw the Japanese government mainly saw film as a propaganda tool. Uh, the economy was pretty bad, especially after the war. But during the war, uh, people like Kurosawa were mainly making uh, propaganda for the government. And I bring up Kurosawa because he's probably the most famous uh, director for Western audiences. His films aren't very Japanese compared to other filmmakers like Ozu. Um, and I brought up Rashomon. Uh, yeah, he's very known for his samurai films, like Seven Samurai, Ron, Kagamusha, a um, couple of others. Let's see. Yes, and Rashomon uh, has a few ghost story elements. Uh, mainly, at the end of the movie, I don't know how many of you have seen it, uh, but it tells... We have one at least. It tells multiple stories, uh, not at the same time, but it tells the same story from different perspectives. And at the end of the movie, I don't want to give too much away here, but at the end of the movie, they bring in someone who can see into the mind of a dead person. So uh, that's kind of Kurosawa's ghost movie story. And that's the only reason I brought him up, is because it's because he's the most famous director to Western audiences. But most of his influences were people like John Ford. So he's very westernized Eastern director. Um, and I think the next slide is a preview of Rashomon. I'm sorry for the crappy audio. ジョン、ビデオ、ビデオ、そしてトマウリ。四つの口が並ばる四つの地獄の声を聞かされた。まさにこれは心のジャングルの藪の中のものがたり。ギラギラと光る重力の目が。ジョン、ジョン、ジョ
the cat briefly in that trailer. That's a recurring theme in some of these. And I missed something that uh, I was looking over in my notes. In the 30s, uh, they had what's called Benshi, B-E-N-S-H-I, in uh, the theaters during the silent era. And they were like narrators for the movies. They would sit over to the side, um, kind of like we had uh, like violinist and orchestra and stuff. The Benchy would sit over to the side in, in, in the movie and narrate what was going on. Uh, they would describe the action and like when the characters were supposed to be speaking, they would like speak the parts and play multiple roles. In the movie. But of course, after the talkies came out, that role died out. So, okay, moving on. Um, I don't know. I I would imagine so, especially in the thirties. <laughs> And so he said, uh, I didn't hear what you were saying. What about the 30s? Would the uh, Benchy do the male and female parts in the 30s? I, I would guess so. Let's see. Uh, this is Ugetsu. Um, and this is going to, I'm going to go through a couple of movies here. Um, I'm not going to really describe the plot of the movies too much. That's why I kind of have the trailers. Um, and. I would recommend you go see all these movies. Uh, I'm just going to describe kind of the importance behind the movies. So this is Ugetsu, directed by Kenji Mizuguchi uh, in 1953. And it is based on Uda Akinira's book um, of the same name. Uh, in the mo I am describing the plot a little bit here. In the movie, one of the main characters, Genjuru, uh, has Buddhist prayers painted on his body to protect himself from the evil spirit. And that's another theme in a few of the movies, too. Um, uh, Mizuguchi made movies about society pre-war. Before the war started, he made movies about the current society. But after the war, he moved from Tokyo to Kyoto in the 50s and began making movies about... Japanese history. Um, and along with Rashomon, Ugetsu was one of the major movies that helped popular, popularize Japanese cinema in the West. It came over about the same time. Let's see. And I just went over that. Um, and I have a passage here from an essay that I want to read about Ugetsu. Uh, in preparing Ugetsu, Mizuguchi was drawn to 6th century chronicles about civil wars and their effect on the common people. As a starting point, he and screenwriter Yoshikata Yoda 
adapted two tales from an 8th century collection of ghost stories, Akinara Ude's Ugetsu Monogatori, Tales of Moonlight and Rain, retaining much of the imagery while altering elements of the story. The perennially dissatisfied Mizuguchi stressed in his notes to the long-suffering Yoda, the feeling of wartime must be apparent in the attitude of every character, the violence of war unleashed by those in power on a pretext of the national good must overwhelm the common people with suffering, moral and physical. Yet the commoners, even under these conditions, must continue to live and eat. This theme is what I especially want to emphasize here. So Mizuguchi was making movies based on classic Japanese ghost stories, but he was infusing them with the modern times, the post-war. Um, and that really comes through in his movies. And I have a trailer from Ugesu. ああ、あかない野望の幻に取り憑かれた男。大きな望みを持たずに出世ができるか。あ、望みは絶対に私か。運命の濁流に転落する女。よ、こんなに落ちぶれてた。お前が出世するんだぜ、みんな狂気さ。さあ
Um, and this movie is not a traditional ghost story. It is... I'll get to that in a second. Um, it's based on the uh, abandonment of old people uh, called Obasuti, um, which is... We kind of see it here in American culture also with movies like Logan's Run. Um, but this is very, very different. Uh, for instance, the main character is an older woman, and she is made fun of because she has too many teeth. Um, a woman of her age in Japan at that time shouldn't have so many teeth to be able to chew her food with. Um, so, at, so at one point in the movie, uh, she is tired of all the kids making fun of her. So she does what any normal human being would do, and she smashes her teeth out. <laughs> yes, it's very disturbing. Um, and there's also a remake of... There's also a remake of this movie in the 80s that uh, may actually be more disturbing than this movie. And, um, see, I think I actually got these bullet points out of order. Yeah, anyways, so the movie is very Kabuki-inspired. Um, it's very stylized, theatrical. Um, almost the entire movie takes place on a set. Um, there's, like, reds in the sky, blues, um, these amazing, brilliant colors, and... Whenever the scene changes, in most movies, you know, there's an edit or a cut. In this, the lights just come down, the set moves out of the way, and another one comes up. It's very, very theatrical. Um, it's very cool. <laughs> um, you don't see that in any American movies, hardly. Uh, it's very Japanese. So, and this, that kind of style shows up in a couple of other movies, too. So that's really all I had to say about that movie. I have a question. Yes. Like, for these movies, do you know originally what the source material was written? Like, like that, like that novel? No, not really. Um, I didn't do too much research on the source material for some of these. Uh, one of them in particular, the one, next one I'm getting to, I did quite a bit of research on. So, that's so why I'm kind of skipping over this one a little bit. And I don't have a trailer for this one. I wish I did because it's a really brilliant looking movie. And going to Quidon. Uh, Quidon is uh, 1965, directed by Masaki Kobayashi, written by Lafcadio Hearn. I'm not sure I'm pr pronouncing that movie right, uh, that name right. Um, how many people are actually from New Orleans, like born and raised here? Have you heard the name Lafcadio Hearn? Okay, okay. Um, I had not before. I'm not originally from New Orleans. I'm from Texas. So I will be getting into that in just a second. So Quite On consists of four episodes, four short stories, the most famous of which is probably Hoichi the Earless, um, where um, a monk is, it's not, he's a blind, excuse me, he's a blind um, singer and I have it written down uh, uh, four supernatural spirits appear and warn Hoichi and he's a blind musician who sings songs about an ancient sea battle uh, he's so good that the ghosts rise up and demand a performance uh, this takes its toll on his health and the monk paints his entire body for the next performance except for his ears so his ears get, get ripped off by the evil spirits. <laughs> this is the most famous scene from this movie. Um, and you see that in the other movie, uh, Ugetsu, where people paint their body with uh, Buddhist prayers and stuff like that. Let's see. And it's also, the name is not to be confused with, oh, sorry. It's also highly stylized, like uh, The Ballad of Narayama. Everything takes place on a set, kabuki, stylized, that kind of thing. Um, let's see. Most popular, yes. And kaidon is a term that means strange, religious, uh, mysterious, rare, or bewitching apparition. Um, in its broadest sense, it means ghost or horror story. It's mainly an old-fashioned term now. Uh, most Japanese horror is just simply referred to as J-horror now, 
if you use Caden to describe something, you're mainly talking about something in the old-fashioned sense. Um, like, it's an old-fashioned ghost story tale, like something like Quaidon or Ugetsu or Jikoku or something like that would be. Uh, the movies we're talking about. And this is a trailer for Quaidon. Yeah, yeah. Uh, look it up. <laughs> I mean, I, I do see it all the time, but I never really thought about it too much. Um, so a little bit of background information on Quaidon and myself personally. I, 
I first saw it in, I think, 2002 or 2003. is my first or second year in college. It's probably the first Japanese horror film that I'd ever really seen other than, like, you know, modern stuff. And it kind of blew me away. And so I moved down here in 2008, 2009, and I'd never heard of, of KDO Hearn. Um, so when I was doing research on this, I was looking, you know, at the writers and all of that for the movies, and I was looking him up, and I realized that he moved, uh, uh, that he lived in New Orleans for 10 years, um, and then he moved to Japan and wrote this movie. So that was probably my most interesting find uh, while I was doing research on this. So he grew up in the Greek Isle, the Greek Ionian Islands, and he originally moved to Cincinnati. His dad was like a Marine of uh, something in the Army or something like that, uh, and then moved to New Orleans in 1877. And, let's see, as um, his output was tremendous. He wrote thousands of articles for, I, at that time, I think it was the Times Democrat. Um, and he's basically credited with inventing New Orleans as um, a distinct culture, uh, voodoo, Mardi Gras, um, letting, many of his articles were published nationally, um, as well as locally, of course. So people all over the country were realizing that New Orleans was this culturally very distinct place. So in the 10 years that he lived here, um, he basically invented what we think of now as this culturally distinct area of New Orleans. Uh, he also wrote the obituaries for Marie Laveau and Dr. John Montney. And let's see, I have some more notes on him too. Um, and of course, and I said that he moved to Japan in 1890 and changed his name to Ko, Koizumi Yokumo. Um, and he was, and he died in 1904. Whenever he moved to a place like New Orleans, he would become completely entrenched in the society. Um, he would completely adapt to his surroundings. And whenever he got, he basically ran himself out in New Orleans, I think. Uh, he like, he wrote so much that he was just done with the city, that he, was, he had to move on. So he moved to Japan and started writing over there. He wrote, um, he's mostly known for his writings in Japan, and Quite On was one of them, and it was one of my favorite films. So finding that out about him was uh, pretty tremendous. And his house is also on Cleveland Street, um, and it's a cultural landmark, so it's pre preserved. You can go visit it. Today, if you want to. Do you know the address of Cleveland? I do not know it offhand. I know it's close to Hanson Willie's. I was looking at it on Google Maps the other day. I passed by it like a million times. And this is Jikoku, the centers of hell. I heard you talking about this earlier. I didn't want to interject because it was coming up. <laughs> uh, directed by Nobu Naga Nakagawa. That's a tongue twister for me right now because I've been speaking a lot. Uh, in 1960, uh, Naka Nakagawa is considered the father of Japanese horror film. Um, much of his work is not available to Western audiences because he produced a lot of work. A um, couple of his movies that are pretty famous in Japan, at least at that time, maybe not so much now, uh, Vampire Moth and Black Cat Mansion. Yes. Let's see. Are these available for me to watch? No, I looked for them. Uh, I could not find them. I mean, try the internet, try eBay. digital, yeah, eBay. I mean, you might be able to pay like a couple hundred bucks for them or something. That's, uh, that's beyond my scope, <laughs> beyond my wallet. See, he started at Toho and then moved to Shin Toho, which was new Toho, uh, and became known as the master of Japanese horror. Jigoku is a striking departure from traditional ghost stories because of its gory imagery. At the end of the movie, the, the still that you just saw is basically hell. Um, 
and there's people getting like their eyes gouged out and stuff like that, stuff that you would more likely see nowadays rather than in 1960. Um, it's loosely based on Oju Yoshi, um, a Buddhist text composed in 985 uh, called as translated to Essentials of Rebirth in the Pure Land, which is known for its graphic depic depictions of hell realms. Um, I think I have. And this transition I thought was very appropriate with the little flames. I played around with this a lot today. Uh, I think I... I know, right? See, I think I covered all of this. Uh, I, like I said, I didn't really go over the plot too much of it because I'd rather just go watch it. Go watch the movie. Can I show the crowd? Uh, I will. And uh, Total Cinema is in like the, the, the studio, yeah. Oh, hold on. I'm sorry. What was that? The production company. Uh, Shintohu. I'm actually. I actually have a whole slide on them. Okay. <laughs> now you have to sit through the flames again. All right, trailer. できない。ねえ。ねえ、もしだって。ねえ、もしだって。I'm sure I'll have some comments from you on the uh, trailers. Yeah, I want to redo the trailers and let's all just make our own comments. <laughs> okay. Shintohu. Uh, Toho, Toho was the largest studio in Japan. I think it still is. Uh, I mean, they've been around forever. So, uh, But Shin, Shintohu was uh, a movie studio made up of defectors from Toho. Toho. Um, it was one of the big six studios during the golden age of Japan, which was, I think, 1950 through like 1970-ish. Um, they were known for exploitation cinema and horror films. Jigoku was the last film they produced before they went bankrupt. Uh, Kurosawa's Stray Dog was the first movie that they released, which is absolutely not a horror or exploit exploitation film. So it's kind of a departure, although it's their first movie, so it's not really a departure. But the rest of it, I think they put out Black Cat Mansion and Vampire Moth and uh, movies like that also. So um, 
they were they're a pretty interesting little story, little uh, production house. Um, there's a quote here about Shintoho, Shintoho uh, that I want to read. Uh, see. Many of Shintoho's top contract directors took stabs at the genre, but it was Nakagawa's talent for turning formula assignments into such distinctly personal forays into gothic excess as Vampire Moth and Black Cat Mansion that separated him from the pack. Rife with eccentric camera movements, jarring sonic surges, soul-smashing twists of karmic retribution, an assortment of hidden, hideously deformed she-demons, de she Nakagawa's smoke machine success of Shintoho spine tinglers would eventually reach their penultimate fever pitch with his 1959 version of, of Ghost Story of Yotu, Yotsuwa, a classic of kabuki theater written in 1825. They had been a perennial of Japanese directors as, dispar as disparate as Shiro Toyoda, Kinoshita, and Fukusawa since its first silent screen incarnation in 1927. Despite the familiarity of this tale of murderous samurai whose ruthless actions are avenged by the ghosts of those he sent to untimely graves, no other ghost story of Yotsuwa had ever or would ever match the intensity of Nakagawa's sin synesthetic tapestry of boiling bloodbaths, irrationally enlarged emotional turmoil, and furiously rotting flesh, ingredients that shocked cine cinemas during the film's initial release and that are today regarded as the missing links between the chimerical Kaidan era of the past and the drone-choked modern nerve janglers of Kurosawa, Kyoshu's Kurosawa, the jet-black gore comedies of Mikie, and the unstoppable shockwaves of the phenomenon known as Ringu. So, is the bond that ties the past to the current of Japanese horror films. The ghost story of Yot Yotsuwa, I have not been able to find. Um, if it's available, then I don't know anything about it. Did you have a question about Shinto? Answer. Uh, yeah, I'm just, just uh, I uh, recognize Toho. Like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, <laughs> one of the biggest, well, the biggest uh, production studio. And yes. They do comedy and drama. Godzilla. Yeah. I do have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. What is, what would be exploitation? So I, I, when I hear that, I'm thinking like the the black exploitation. Black exploitation, like, you know, yeah. Like Shaft and all that. Uh huh. So um, would be something kind of similar. The movies that were listed, um, I had not heard of any of them, and they were all in Japanese. So oh, I. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think the exploitation because this is right around when that company formed. Um, there's exploitation that's known as pink films, and it's an entirely different genre of film that broke off after people were not like really big fans of period films and whatnot. And that's one reason why like things like big war films and whatnot were gaining such an audience because they were so alternative. But for a while, there was this huge pink film movement, which is like if you take soft pornography, soft war pornography, and mix it with like highly paid, well-known directors and artists and producers and making like impassioned stories about them and kind of mixing them together. And that was what was being filmed. So like a George Lucas made of something. Good story. <laughs> you might want to Yeah, you know, well, well <laughs> not that <actually. laughs> But yeah, it's, that was the name of the genre and um, um, Shinto and a few others like it were producing a lot of those films at the time. And actually during the 60s it was the, like the, the golden age of pink film. And so there was a big, like some of the biggest films made. Sorry. Oh. <laughs> then uh, maybe I was going to say possibly uh, like war, war theme movies and kind of, uh, I don't know, um, uh, over dramatization of like the Japanese perspective of the war and maybe exploiting. Oh yeah, like war exploitation movies. Yeah, so war yeah. Movies, especially you know from the fifties on, when things kind of die down. Yeah. Moving on, okay, Jigoku, and this is Onibaba, directed by Kanito Shindo. Let's see.
Um, this is a quick summary of the plot. Uh, deep within the windswept marshes of war-torn <laughs> medieval Japan, an impoverished mother and her daughter-in-law eke out a lonely, desperate existence, forced to murder lost samurai and sell their belongings for grain. They dump the, courses, the corpses down a deep, dark hole and live off of their meager spoils. When a bedraggled neighbor turn, returns from the skirmishes, lust, jealousy, and rage threaten to destroy the trio's tenuous existence before an ominous, ill-gotten de demon mask, which you just saw, seals the trio's horrifying fate. Driven by primal emotions, dark eroticism, and a frenzied score by Hayashi and stunning images, both lyrical and macabre, Shinoto's chilling folktale Onibaba is a singular cinematic experience. That tells it better than I could. Um, and of course, and it's a Buddhist parable meant to encourage women's attendance at religious convocations. That is very loosely based on that, from what I understand. Um, let's see. And let's see, I have another quote here. Uh, in Shindo's hands, the parable is gleefully deformed into a cautionary tale about sexual jealousy and unrequited passion, reaffirming his propensity for superimposing the modern and the ancient, not to mention God and the devil. Not only was Onibaba the director's first period film set in the 6th century, 16th century during a time of constant war and ceaseless famine, it was also his first to place an overt focus in shot after shot of the topless torsos of its central characters on the ways that sexual desire, while essential to human survival, can also have cataclysmic consequences. Deep in an endless field of suggestingly swaying seven-foot-high Suzuki grass, a middle-aged woman, uh, her, her fright wig black hair sprayed to one side with an inexplicably shock white streak, and her feral daughter-in-law spend their days lying in wait for errant samurai to happen near the lair. Fleeing their wars, raging well beyond the forest of undulating frauds, the exhausted samurai who enter the Suzuki succumb to the apparent sanctuary of the grasses, only to be set upon by the women who slay them as they rest. So, this movie, whenever I first saw it, um, the, the score is also not mentioned in here, but it has an amazingly brilliant score, and it really, really drives this movie home. Um, that's going to be, you'll, you'll hear a little bit of it in the trailer, but whenever you see the demon mask, like, coming at you through the grass for the first time, and you hear the score, like, this pounding score in the background, um, it's pretty frightening, <laughs> uh, especially if it's one of the first movies you've seen, like, a Japanese horror film. Uh, and and it, the cinematography is also very beautiful. I was going to talk more about cinematography, but I got kind of overwhelmed with some of these movies. Um, the, the black and white in this movie is brilliant. Um, it's really stark, really contrasty. Uh, so is uh, the next movie, uh, which I want to get to really quick because it's already past 8 o'clock. So I'm going to go ahead and show this uh, trailer for Onibaba. <laughs>
right, so that was Honey Baba. And this one is Kuroniko, also by Shindo. Um, night, and this one's 1968. Uh, this is very similar to Oni Baba, because it, it is essentially a tale of revenge with a feminist angle. And it is based on a Japanese folk story about Onro, Onryo, uh, the vengeful spirits of those who are abused in life, usually women, come back with a rage so powerful that it can't be contained. So, um, in this case, whenever the spirits come back, they transform into cats. And you saw the cat in the Rashomon trailer also, which is a theme in a lot of uh, the stories. So, let's see. And the, the cats are called Bakaniko, B-A-K-E-N-E-K-O. It's a kissing cousin to the shape-shifting fox, Kitsune, and the sly Tanuki, T-A-N-U-K-E. Uh, they're not inherently evil, but they're capable of using supernatural knack for mimicking other creatures, including humans, to stir up trouble. Uh, in the case of Kuroniko, uh, they seem more evil uh, because they are exacting revenge on people. I mean, they've already had evil done to them, but they're doing evil to other people. So, let's see. And, uh, let's see. This is, it was, this movie was also directed by Shindo, the other person that did uh, Onibaba. So, this is very similar in that it has really influenced modern J-horror movies like Ringu uh, and Juon. And um, let's see. It's also, sh obviously it's also shot in black and white. Uh, you saw that from the still and you'll see it in the trailer. Very stark. Shindo obviously had a style. Um, yeah, uh, let's see. Supernatural can. Black Cat Mansion, which I have mentioned a couple of times. The cat is a theme in a lot of these movies. So let's watch the trailer. を<笑>
think that that's my favorite one of the bunch. Uh, maybe this next one, huh? It's eyebrows, I know. Even the guy had that. You see someone with eyebrows like that, why are you looking up for something wrong? I'd run from that. Well, I would too, but I, I, I have normal eyebrows. I don't know. So I have one more movie left. And other than Kuroniko, I think it might be the most, it's, it's the most enjoyable of the bunch because it is House. House is an amazing movie. Um, obviously, the cat is a theme again. The, this cat specifically spews blood everywhere. So, I like that cat. It is a different type of cat. Let's see. House, House was directed by Nobuhiko Obayashi in 1977. Um, he was a like kind of graphic designer, uh, commercial director who came over from that area of video making and stuff and made a movie basically. Um, so House ended up being this like kind of throw all of 70s pop culture onto the screen and make a weird movie. Um, it's kind of best described as Scooby-Doo plus <laughs> Japanese horror. It's really, really difficult to describe this movie uh, without just going to see it uh, because it has a haunted piano that kills people, um, the, key, the keys attack people, then the whole thing eats a person. Uh, of course, then... <laughs> Uh, no, it's not at all like Stephen King. It's really not. <laughs> it's the things are possessed, but they're not. They're not like scary. Like Stephen King tries to make stuff scary. This is like kind of funny, scary. Like I have the trailer. Just hold on a little bit. Um, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, I guess I probably should just play the trailer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll, yeah, whatever. <laughs> I will play the trailer, and then if anyone wants to talk about it, we can. It's like talking to your parents after you see something really strange for the first time. Like for October, we're gonna be seeing any of these movies. This is something I wanna. Huh? We're gonna be seeing any of these movies for October. Uh, Uzumaki, we're seeing Not House, um, Onibaba, the got shown last year. Yeah, that was, that was, that's a horror that was like a No, last October. Um, it was shown last October, well, no, actually I don't think that one, that was not But no, none of these are actually upcoming, but I do want to see House. I have it. You can borrow it. Thank you. All right. Uh, so here's the trailer. Mm, now. It is. Just <laughs> chill out. House. 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 House.
Is, as the first film in Drogo Vision. Yeah. Best scene while on drugs. Don't <laughs> <laughs> you know, have a Blu ray uh, player. I have a Blu ray version of it. Oh, I, oh. I, I, ha I have it on Blu ray also yeah. if you want to borrow it, Nick. Yeah, I'm yeah. going to borrow it. <laughs> I think it's on Hulu Plus also. If anyone has Hulu. I like, I like Can I answer a quick fun fact about this? Kind of movie? Absolutely. Um, I'm not exactly sure if it's the first, but House does actually have a video game, an RPG. It was one of the, it is actually one of the uh, Keystone uh, JRPGs that kicked off, uh, kicked off what we have now today, such as Dragon Quest and uh, Final Fantasy. Nice. I did not know that. <laughs> Do they have that on any emulators you can download? I don't know. I caught that information out from one of my favorite guys that goes through video games. And why it's all the uh, cultural, uh, yeah. cultural that is in video games, Gajin Duma. So check out this stuff. Awesome. Was it Gajin Duma or Kaiman did? One of the two, but yeah, they talk about Um, I don't really have too much to say about modern Japanese horror, because I, I don't watch that much of it. I mean, I've seen a fair, I've seen some, but not as much as probably a lot of other people have here. Um, I think that someone else should do a presentation on it. Uh, maybe Nick, maybe someone. Uh, I will give people nightmares. Okay. No, that's fine. I'm just saying um, all this stuff kind of, all the movies that I've talked about today kind of have influenced these movies, and that's, that's pretty much it. And if anyone has any questions, discussion, we kind of talked about House. <laughs> could, you, could you put a list of all these on the um, I can export this PowerPoint. I'm recording it. It has hyperlinks in it. Yeah. Are you recording this? I am. Can you see the red dot? I wonder what that bit of stupidity was. Yeah. <laughs> I thought your thing was just red. I knew he was red. Yeah. It records the PowerPoint and the audio in line, so I can just export it all at once. Very fancy. So if I say how awesome I am, you just repeat that. Oh, I'm probably going to cut this part out altogether since we're at the end. That is the best part. What's the whole deal? I don't know if anybody else knows. What's the whole deal with the iCloud? Yeah. I've been wondering. Well, we have the internet. Um, I did not bother looking up what's the deal with the eyebrows. That was more of a cultural thing. I would like to say, hey, don't you die? Like, you know, the hell period. Just the women who were uh, married, though, or, you know, or demons. <laughs> affiliated <laughs> with uh, men of power and, and, like, very high up families. Like, these are women, you know, yeah, for a child as well. Basically, belonging to men who were either big political figures or very rich men. Married so. yeah. into the families. Yeah. But um, this is a comment. Like, uh, I'm, you shave your eyebrows I uh, I got started off with more modern Japanese horror films, and to see like the earlier Japanese horror and how those were, I could immediately draw connections between the two. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah. And then uh, like seeing where there was like a, a breaking point, or like a like where it kind of went in another direction where it is right now with like. To go who? Yeah. So, yeah, just being able to see that kind yeah. of over time in the way she presented it. The 60s were a time of change for a lot of stuff. For those of you who may have been able to see the last few years, I think you had time she's been telling the team of water, she's been able to see the audition, and he did a lot of 
the um, masses of mob, did that one called uh, the tax. Mm -hmm. The only one that would not show in the American world. Yeah, I, I've seen audition. Yeah, that was pretty. Yeah. Audition's pretty great. Yeah. In a really messed up way. Yeah. Um. Yeah, she was in the Japanese horror movie on her every one too. Just watch audition. <laughs> yeah. Watch anything about beef, I guess. Yeah. Go past birthday in twenty minutes, and then all of a sudden change. Yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, it was on the show. He's a comedian. He's also a director. You should watch That was out. I'm done. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> oh, thank you.